Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. On this Tartarian episode, for some fucking reason, my microphone is not set up right. There we go. Oh boy, what it takes to set up this show. See, this is a retail location, so like people during the day walk through this location. So I have to get it late at night. All right, so today I want to make an episode related to the Tartarian movement online. We're going to start off with the focus on giants. And then we're going to move over to some of the things that are kind of not related to Tartaria at all. And discuss sort of this no forest on flat earth thing that came out in 2015, 2016 from some Russian guy, at least pretending to be in the video. No offense to the guy is. And it was just the most asinine thing on planet earth. So we're going to cover that. Now let's say that you've never heard of Tartarian theory at all. You're just a normal person surfing the web. Saw a little thumbnail. Seemed interesting. Tartarian is sort of a dual-sided theory that's going on around the world right now. It is a movement of people that have been looking at old photographs and then looking at history that's written more recently that claims that uh, we were basically Neanderthals just a couple hundred years ago. I don't mean that literally, but it's like, hey, we were living in mud huts, we were idiots, nothing was cool, there was no heavy construction, except the seven wonders of the world, which of course at this point is probably 70 wonders of the world. I have to say, it just depends on the validity of the photographs I'm seeing, because with a little bit of effort and imagination, anything can be forged. I can forge an old page in a book. I could physically forge it in the real world and take a picture of it and then be flipping through a book. It's not really old, but I can get it weathered up to that point. Print it on a crappy paper that goes acidic really bad, turns yellow within a day or two, and then flip through it and you might believe it. But in terms of Photoshop, 3D, hmm, we can just go all day long. And today, there's a lot of helper apps that will do it for you, right? At least for the average brain. But just prior, and we're going to bring it all together here fairly quickly and then start discussing. Before the Tartarian movement, which is based on someone claiming that there was a culture out there called, Tar- well, there's a place called Tartaria and there's a people called the Tartarians. It's sort of like this undefined, you get to make up whatever you want information about a civilization that may or may not have existed. There's a hyper-focus on the Gilded Era, which I have to say is one of the more unequivocal areas of human history where we had really hit a stride of design and invention and gigantic construction with modern human beings, being in photographs, being in etchings, because, you know, newspapers didn't always have uh, photography, so they would hire a person to etch into wood, Uh, basically a stamp that would be used to create the images in newspapers back in the day. But a lot lot of these places were at least photographed in their decaying form so that you could see that they've been there for a very long time. Structures that seem to be built to last, right? Look at the Empire State Building. It has been there a very long time. It does not look like it's about to fall apart. And there hasn't been any major, major reconstruction, updating it's just built to last and it's built out of this gilded era people are finding structures that were built in major cities from chicago to new york that had uh, well one 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 home was built i believe it was uh, 47 million dollars in the 20s 30s lived in for 70 seven years or something like that and the guy just gives it away basically so that a super, so like a Woolworths could be built in its place. They tore his place down, which supposedly had more technology in one building than anyone had ever seen. That's the claims. It could be marketing material, but I, it's got to have some validity to it. But he spent $47 million 
at a time when my grandmother's uh, monthly income as a teacher might have been $40 a month. If I said to you, I'm building a house on Huntington Beach for $47 million, your jaw would just hit the ground. That's a tremendous amount of money. But imagine it 80 to 100 years ago. Okay. Just prior to me experiencing Tartarian theory, probably for a year before, if not two or three years before, the mud flood theory uh, came into fruition. The mud flood theory, if you're new to that one, is a theory that uh, somehow people who control this paradigm of existence, whether it be a firmament dome or even a smaller idea, a continent, that they were able to orchestrate gigantic floods that not only flooded, but was able to specifically move soil from one place to another place. I haven't seen anyone um, prove this out even one time that it, it doesn't seem ludicrous. There are mud floodings that happen, you know, where you've got a, 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 a landing, a strip of land. You build on it. Not paying attention to the fact that there's mountains around you with no foliage. When it rains, if it doesn't have foliage to hold the earth down, the mud comes down and it fills up. So one side of the building loses a, a front entrance or the first story entrance, and you have to go to the second one. It can, it can keep going for a long time just depending on where you built and what the terrain is like. That is not mud flooding as it has been presented. The other notion is, is that we have definitely built on top of our previous builds over and over again to an astonishing level of erasing history. That much is completely true. You know, you go into the Capitol building in the United States and there's another building down below with a with a look what looks like a column entrance and everything. The big giant building uh well the Parthenon the big giant rock that the Parthenon's on supposedly has countless civilizations underneath it. Venice, countless civilizations underneath it. All over England, especially in London. Oh my gosh. Just dig, keep digging, and it's just another one down there and another one down there. It's like, when does this stop? The Egyptians, through Brian Forrester, he has taken tours down four stories, and I think it was something... Um, along the lines of like 650 feet down, four stories. And they said, look, there's 20 plus stories down there. At the fourth story, uh, they <laughs> realized that the floor is made of basalt rock, a rock that comes from Lebanon. Can't get it in Egypt. Lebanon's full of red granite, which you can't get in Lebanon. You got to get it from Egypt. So there was some thoroughfare back and forth, but the slab of rock they were standing on was a 20 to 30 by 30 foot room with about a foot and a half of water in it. And they're standing on it thinking, okay, wait a minute. If this rock is here and it's honed into the ground, they couldn't really see it to see if it was tiled or not. The stuff is heavy and there's plenty of evidence. They brought thousand ton cubes of basalt from wherever, dug them out to make boxes and those boxes are 100 tons. So they got rid of 900 tons of, of the inside of these things on some of the rocks. Uh, ball back, Lebanon, several thousand ton stones, not, not basalt, but just regular local uh, granite or what have you. And so the Tartarian movement has been sort of turned into a bucket theory for all of these anomalies in history. And of course, the overtone is something I think that we can all suspect, but we have to be careful, that we have obviously been told false history. Uh, and we know there's false history in different metrics, different dimensions of, of history. There's who won a war, who was the bad guy, who was the good guy, who was a good leader, who was a bad leader. You know, where did Hitler die? That kind of stuff. And then there's like, okay, nobody really knows, uh, going back even a few hundred years, whether or not the, the tiny amount of documentation that is trying to record the world that we have uh, made available to us is remotely true. 
religions are completely created out of thin air, written by the Kingsmen or someone like Francis Bacon, who creates the King James Bible in, I think, like 1613. And when all the elders uh, from the time said, hey, where did he get his reference material? The Kingsmen said, go pound sand. We're not going to tell you. And the reason why they were asking is that we, they hadn't heard of a lot of things that he came up with out of all the ancient scrolls. 1947, they dig out the Dead Sea Scrolls. Same exact year, the Arabs counteracted that with the Anunnaki Scrolls that they had dug up in Egypt. It was a war. You're going to make up shit? We're going to make up shit. Let's go at it. I am seeing, you know, Telegram channels really push Tartarianism, and I, I dig it because I want people to think like that. That's great, and I want to learn from them, and it's going to be great. There was a huge push in the last two years to make you believe that giants um, not only existed, which they did, but existed in ways that uh, they used a lot of CG art to make you believe that uh, they were walking around very recently. Um, and like, there's, there's two ways to look at the giant thing. Once you understand expanding Earth and you study it and you really study it, you don't just glance at it in a video or oh, doom, you will learn that the Earth expands. And this is going to be a big part of the no forest, no flat Earth solution for your brain. As the Earth displaces ether in the universe, which the Michelson experiment completely lacked any understanding of what ether was, therefore was able to declare that ether didn't exist. Hilarious, right? But it, the bigger the ball gets in space, the more it displaces ether. The more it displaces ether, the more pushing you're going to feel from space and you're going to have more gravity on your body. And we want to have a certain a mean of gravity on our body. So that if the Earth's smaller, humans can be larger and other beings can be larger too. And as the Earth gets bigger, we get smaller because there's more pressure on us and there is a, a perfect mean of gravity to keep the biological entity that is homo sapien sapien alive. It does us a disservice to have people use bad CG that's, that's washed out in a sepia tone. They always make it super blurry to make it look old. Therefore, the CG doesn't have to be that great to convince your average person who doesn't have any knowledge in computer graphics that this was real. I guess if you had the book of history, you know, out of the Vatican's basement, the Alexandria Library that was never burned down, but just the library was burned down, but the books were kept. If you had history and you want to re-educate people on what really happened, you could CG the whole thing to show everybody what we think we know about history. That'd be great. But what they want to do is, is take anyone who's waking up and attach you to crazy to have you distribute a video of a CG uh, diaper wearing, uh, what is it? There's ones like kind of an Asian looking sumo wrestler walking down a street. Complete bullshit. If you know how to do computer graphics, you'll just look at it and go, oh my God, really? This is, you think this is real? The other one that was really popular in the last couple of years was uh, this notion that, that the 1800s, ending in the Gilded Era, had robots everywhere. Just walking around helping stuff and, and doing boxing matches and pulling carts and all this other crap. Again, just take a look. They're either, uh, in 10% of the cases, someone constructed a funny man-like thing out of pipes and all kinds, maybe even an army helmet hat and that kind of thing. Took a picture of it. It was an installation, something to bring the kids down. Just like if you go to Bubblegum Shrimp, okay, they've got a statue of Tom Hanks sitting on a bench. He's not real. It's just a little gimmick to get you to come and sit next to him and take a picture, right? But some people have created CG videos from a time that didn't have moving film to show you how these things were boxing around. And some of them are supposed to be in the, in the 20th century. We're getting a tremendous amount of high-def, up res uh, movies from the 1800s, which is just astonishing. The furthest back I've seen is 1896, where they're filming New York or Paris or other major cities. And they have filled in all the frames that are missing 
and then cleaned it up with AI. I think it's a lot of meticulous hand generated stuff. I mean, not in hand art, but just really tuning the colors, palettes, and what is what and fixing all the errors. It's stunning. Absolutely stunning. One of them was a little girl feeding her cat some breakfast. It's the rich who had access to this uh, this equipment. But what's interesting about it is the equipment was way more proliferated than we ever thought. I mean, people were owning an, an invention that was supposed to be in its embryonic laboratory stage. So that automatically shows you it wasn't always the way you thought. You know, Nikola Tesla was famous for putting a, a remote control boat in the water, uh, in, in the water in New York, like the Hudson River, and driving it around with a remote control uh, device, right? And then later he was asked if he was depressed that Marconi created the radio. It's like, oh, you have no idea. The voice was the easy part. He skipped. He created a digital protocol between a remote control and a boat. So it would stop and start. Plus, you put a battery on the boat. Batteries you didn't have back in those days. Not like they do today, right? You can't just go and get a pack of D batteries. But I'm going to throw you one of the areas of Tartarianism that is sort of a linchpin of the theory. And it has to do with giant doors to, to buildings and giant buildings in general. And there's a point to it, right? There's a point to why the hell are these buildings so gigantic? Why are doors 40 feet tall? Were giants there? And that is the reason why these were built so large and that somehow the giants died out. And, you know, there's always the theory that little guys like us, uh, you know, teamed up just like the old stories of cavemen killing the woolly mammoth through pack hunting, that somehow we would take out all the big guys, could be that the earth just became essentially unhealthy for them because it kept getting larger and they kept getting heavier. And eventually, mm, you know, the, the giants that we have today, I mean, the NBA is like the, the largest you can get and still move around healthy. But you know, those folks that are nine feet tall or whatever, not quite nine feet, but there's an Asian, uh, always a male or female in Asia that is super high, super tall because of glandular problems, and they're just in pain constantly. A lot of them die really early, right? Way before they hit their 40th birthday because the world is formidable to them. It's, it's, not, it's hostile to them. But let me give you something that I think you will appreciate. Put your thinking caps on for one second. Clear your mind because we're going to go into something. It's going to be really easy to understand. But clear your slate. You're going to enjoy this. To the degree you can clear your mind out, you're going to dig this, okay? Now, I studied Egyptology for six years straight and really got into the architecture, really got into hieroglyphs, got into the history of it, and then put another 20 years into it, which I've shared with you on this show, all the mind-blowing contradictions of that place. We don't have to go there to understand what I'm about to tell you. We can see the temples in Egypt. A few things you might want to know is that, one, the Egyptian temples and their columns are more ornate than any other columns in the world. The flutedness, the, the palm leaves at the top, the geometry in their columns is second to none because you have to give them exponential credit for being able to create these things without modern machinery. But even today's most modern stone workers with laser cutters and robots that actually shave off shapes, it is, it is um, a diminishing return to create any of these shapes with the current equipment because it will simply cost an incredible amount of money. It's been verified by one of the best stone makers or stone handlers in the United States. Now, when you have a culture in architectural terms. One of the things that, that architects have understood and, and engineers have figured out is that the earlier temples had lots of columns and they were very close to each other. And that allows the stone to go across the top up there and it can build a rooftop, right? If they so choose. The more modern a culture, outside of ornate front doors, front doors are a little bit different. You can put a lot of columns together on a front door 
simply for the, the shock and all of it. But to hold up the building inside, the columns get further and further apart. The architecture is getting better, more sophisticated. Now, I want you to think about this. We know that we take things for granted today that didn't exist in the past. And that list is virtually infinite. It's not, but I mean, it's everything that man's ever created. It's that list long, okay? What if I told you that doors didn't exist initially? That a door, especially to something as horrendously large as these temples, didn't exist. But temples grew to their heights out of sheer templeness, right? Temples were to worship God. It's sort of like the, you know, building a structure to touch the heavens sort of thing. They built them up and they built them big because this was to worship literally the cosmology that you were in. Regardless if you're an um, atomistic God worshiper and there's only one God or a pluralistic, you worship idols, you simply built these structures to be the most gorgeous, self-honoring exhibitions of your mathematical skills, your artistic skills. And so they were built large for any number of reasons. We really don't have the definitive knowledge of what inspired them to build them large, but they're there today. Okay. We know that the theories that came out of Cairo area and all of Egypt, which is a very special place built by people that no longer exist built by people that do not live there today. The Arabs inherited that area. They did. Otherwise, they would have continued the construction and they would be in like a panther city in a stealth cloud. But they inherited it. They don't understand it. Therefore, they don't build anything else remotely like it, nor contribute to the overall population of the world more technology that is way beyond where they had taken it initially. They inherited it. The race that built it is most likely gone. But we know it crossed the river, it crossed the Mediterranean Sea, and it got to Rome. It got to Greece, Greece first and Rome. And the standard was set. I wouldn't say primitive man, but man at that time had seen temples and other locations, gigantic temples, and said, we must build something to at least equal, if not rival, our competitors. They built them out of different materials, because they don't have the materials that that other area indigenously digs out of the ground. Limestone being Egypt's rock of choice and marble potentially being more of the, the, uh, the Greek and the Roman accessibility, right? We know there was an exchange between Lebanon, Baalbek area and Egypt, Egypt, because they need each other's stuff to complete what we have found in their respective areas. Unless we unearth something that is more local, um, that's where it came from. So you have these giant temples. They're arbitrary in choice, being as tall as they are and as high as they are and as amazing as they are. Now, at some point, they started building temples. Temples with walls inside the column area. And uh, it would have a roof, uh, most of them. And they'd build another temple inside, another temple inside, these little walls going inside. So they understood walls at some point. It's much different than a mud hut that a particular society might have lived in, maybe, say, during a time of constructing the pyramids. Not slaves, just citizens, building one of the most amazing things on planet Earth, or several of them, actually. But at some point, the concept of a door arrives. A real door. A counterbalanced, gigantic, multi-ton door. Those aren't average doors. If you see a metal door that is 40 feet tall, and I've seen plenty, not in real life, but definitely through photographs with tourists standing in front of them, etc. I want you to conceive of building that yourself. First, the door itself is a formidable object to build. It has got to be extremely strong. It's got to be thick. It's got to be very balanced. When it's straight up and down, you can't have the tip being... Uh, completely off center from the base, or perhaps if you're balancing it on the hinge, you want all the way to go back and you're going to have to build it to match that mathematical exactitude. Otherwise this thing doesn't work. Okay. 
What's the first kind of door anybody builds? They build one door and they put it on a hinge. Well, what's interesting is I don't see a lot of those doors when you talk about this old architecture. It's a door that's split in half, typically. Even if it has a square casing on the top or an arch casing, I think arch is the deluxe sun version. Now you want to have both the doors behave exactly the same in opposite polarities. One's the right door, one's the left door. You want to be able to just, as a tiny person, a five-foot person, grab some sort of buckle or push it with your hand from the inside or outside, however it swings, right? And have it do all of the work because it's balanced. There's a giant ridiculous door in the uh, Coral Castle in Florida. A 110-pound man made a door that I think weighs somewhere around 40 tons. It's balanced. He did it all by himself. And they want you to believe it was just a bunch of pulleys and stuff. It's really funny. I believe that the door to these giant facilities was merely a response of enclosing an arbitrarily tall structure. Why were all of the buildings that look like Roman construction super tall? What's the point? Do I need 50 feet over my ceiling? No. But on one level, that is just like the Mandalorian. It's the way we build these buildings. Two, it's mind-blowing to walk up to something gigantic. It just is. You walk up to Half Dome in Northern California in Yosemite Park. It's mind-blowing. You walk up to the Empire State Building. It's mind-blowing. Giant things blow minds. It's just that simple. So these temples are supposed to put you in a state of suggestibility to, to, to impress you so intensely that you're no longer thinking about your world. You're thinking about, I am in a very sacred place. Look at how much effort and science went into this place. Effort being the art and science being the way that it was put together. It's giving you exactly the emotion and the transformational state that they want you in when you go in the front door and listen to a story. This is where you're from. This is who God is. This is it. Ra is this, and the Pharaoh is that, and that's what they build them that way. When someone says they're in charge, well, imagine you have two different situations. You have a guy walk up to you and say, uh, 80, 80 BC, it's Titus Flavius. He's just pretty cool. He's the Caesar of the day. And he walks up to you and he says, uh, I'm Caesar. I'm in charge of this whole city. I'm in charge of Rome, and Rome has basically owned this area for a couple thousand years. The ninth generation Roman Ptolemy Cleopatra reports to me. And you're looking at him, you're like, you know what? You look like my uncle, and he's like a pedo. I, I don't know if I really think that you're in charge just because you tell me you're in charge, someone might say. But now let's... Uh, Let's retell the story. You're in your little apartment complex somewhere in Rome. It's not very clean. You got rodents everywhere. You can smell your neighbor's toilet. And uh, a legion comes to your house, knocks on the door with the formidable gear on and maybe a big old sword or a spear or something, a pike. And they say, uh, you're being see uh, summoned by Caesar. Come, or else you're going to have some problems. And you're like, oh, my gosh, let me put on a robe worthy of Caesar. You get a little dressed up. I have the toothpaste off your mouth, right? And you go, and you go, and you follow this legion, and you're looking at these dudes that could cut you in half in two seconds, pull your arms out of your sockets without even doing anything but just pulling on you, right? And they're following this guy. Whew. Who could get these dudes to follow them? And you see thousands of them as you're going towards one of these giant Roman facilities. They march you up these stairs. Maybe they're 50 feet ascension, right? Bing, 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 bing. And you go through these giant columns that are 80 feet tall, sculpted out of marble, ribbed to perfection. It starts to smell different. It smells super clean. There's ladies and guys and counselors and people dressed in the like what would be the equivalent of thousands of dollars worth of clothing. 
You haven't even met the guy yet. A few minutes later, you go into the main hall. It's Don DeLuise, you know, laying there on a chaise lounge and he's eating grapes or whatever. And he sits up and he says, I'm Caesar. I run this town. Now, what is your impression? Because of the ornate nature of the environment, you now believe the guy is Caesar. And you have to understand that's the way and the reason they build those big locations to basically say, you don't get this kind of building unless you're in charge. It's, it's a nonsensical association, to be honest, but it does the job. It makes a giant civilization of people that can't even read and write come into a city and go, well, that's the big folks. See how he doesn't, <laughs> what was it? Uh, it was uh, Monty Python, A Quest for the Holy Grail. And King Arthur goes by, a grand chap, and goes by, you know, with this guy behind him doing the coconut thing. And he says, he must be a king. And he says, how, why do you say that? And he's, uh, the, I think the woman, or maybe Terry Jones being a woman, I don't know, says, because he doesn't have shit all over him. It's a brilliant line. It's a brilliant, brilliant line. That movie's got more utter brilliance of how civilization works than most documentaries that are trying to do exactly the same thing. By the way, Terry Jones shot a uh, two-part series on uh, Israel and how it came to be and how who used to live there before when it was uh, aired through BBC. If you ever find it, uh, definitely watch it. All those guys were scholars, you know. So they start putting doors up on these giant buildings. The doors got smaller over time, didn't they? I do a lot of 3D uh, renderings for architects and designers. I just did a property that wanted to do a lot of arches. Turned out to be gorgeous. However, the, the bare minimum that has to occur, if you want to put an arch in a doorway or an arch that anyone has to walk past as a daily function. A door needs to be seven feet high to meet code. And if you think about it, there's, there's a few people in the NBA that are going to have to duck every time they go through that door. It's still not good. Shaq O'Neal has been in this room right here, believe it or not, smoked a hookah no more than 25 feet from me right here. Imagine that dude. He comes through this front door. He had to lean down to get through this door. So if you're going to put an arch on a doorway, pay attention to one thing as you see these photographs, because the door could be 20 feet tall. But the arch begins right around the place where code says it needs to be that high for an average person to walk in without bending down. Because if you start an arch too soon, you're going to bang your head into it when you go around the corner. I wouldn't get as excited about the large door thing being some sign that Giants built these uh, facilities. You have to understand, regardless of how much they have revised history, we are still finding Homo sapiens sapiens next to these giant structures that were built. So, you know, there is a potential theory that maybe giants built some of these places and that they stopped using them, died off at a different location. Humans got in there and died next to the construction sites that they had actually built. But one of the biggest telltale signs is, let me ask you, this is a little analogy for your brain. If I were to set a table for you and I, and I put out a plate and some utensils, the table's got a height, the chairs have a height, and the utensils have a size to fit in this hand, the average size hand, okay? But now, if you're talking about people who have an average height of between 9 and 12 and a half feet, which is all the research I was able to find in articles in the United States. And that's huge, by the way. That's huge. Okay. How big is the table now? How high are the seats? How gigantic is, are the utensils? They're going to be 25 to 30% bigger. Everything. An 18-inch chair where you put your butt, it's usually around 18 inches off the ground. I don't know what the metric is. Well, they're going to need to be 24 inches off the ground minimum. Right? You're going to have to add inches on to get them up so that they don't feel like they're reclined as they're sitting down because they're way bigger. Okay. 
when you look at the construction techniques of Egyptian temples, Greek temples, Roman construction of all kind, the pieces and parts that assemble together to build columns out of pieces, there are some that are, the ones in Lebanon are all one big, gigantic red granite. In fact, where the treasury is, there's not gigantic columns, but they're all one piece, and they're like seven feet tall. It's a whole different thing to lathe. Okay, how do you lathe red granite, a nine level nine rock, to the point there's no semblance of lathing? You don't have any grooves or anything that looks like it was lathed, right? Now, we know there's circular saw stuff all over Egypt. We have to assume, too, that some of the circular saw stuff that occurred uh, was modern manipulation of old ruins, but we have plenty of old ruins that are being literally dug out of the ground and they have circular saw marks on them. So, hmm, I'm not sure what's going on here, right? History is definitely a pile of confusion. But it does not look like we have massive giants like the Nephilim stories, right? That's where if you go into the Anunnaki scrolls that were dug up in 47, just around the time the Christians said they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is really more about people of light and people of darkness, very interesting. You know, how much bigger do you think that human beings were? That and, and if you want to believe that they were 25, 30 feet, then the construction needs to resemble this. And not just a few slabs in America. You know, they've got some, uh, definitely some graves with big giant slabs, you know, that made up the roof and the walls and stuff. Eh, maybe that's a little bit on that level but where are the temples? Where are the, you know, where rocks are being, rocks would be potentially way bigger because they're bigger and they can move things. When they do a, a lever and they transfer that energy, they're going to be able to move something way bigger than us, right? And that may be where things like the pyramids come from, where you've got two and a half million stones making one pyramid. That may not take that long. Who knows, right? Now, let's get at sort of the heart, potentially, because a lot of these uh, Telegram posts, anything that's just like a post forum, there's a limited amount of information being shared at any one point in time. And one of the problems we have with society, of course, is everybody's so cell phoned out. The more you use a cell phone, the more you lose your linear mind, which is what you're born with, and you become a goldfish. You only remember the last few seconds of any thought that's ever been injected at you. It, it makes you susceptible to those who are linear. Linear people can control nonlinear people in two seconds. If you had a pincer maneuver, for instance, right, in war, a person who's nonlinear cannot think of a pincer maneuver because it is a forward strategy. When they drop into here, the trap uh, ensues and they get slammed from both sides. Okay. That's where phonetic language created the linear mind. Instead of looking at symbols for everything, like China just recently got out of symbols, although they're largely still symbols, you don't get a linear mind. You get a now mind. And it's functional up to a point. Nonlinear minds become good soldiers, but they are not good philosophers. They are not good politicians. They end up getting communist country uh, on top of them because the few that pop out into linear go, man, I control all these people. And maybe, again, it's the best thing to do for folks that have just crawled out of, you know, nonlinear alphabets. But the linear th thought behind the Tartarian movement in general is that we are raised with family members that typically tell us the truth, thus giving us a false uh, ability to believe what we are told. Because you have to at some point, right? We've talked about this several times in different episodes. If you don't trust that food keeps you alive and you don't eat, you starve, right? There's all kinds, millions of little things your parents teach you. By the time you get ejected into the world, which today gets injected into your household through telephones, thus usurping the parent. The parent gets kicked out the second the parent gives a child a cell phone. They're basically saying, I'm done with you, child. My love for you ends today. You're not going to be raised by TikTok. You're going to be raised by Facebook, Instagram. I'm out of the game. Uh, and, and within a year, your child will most likely implode. Their self-identity will get all screwed up. And you will become a second-class citizen 
very quickly. Our history is inaccurate for a billion reasons. Our history is inaccurate because it's difficult to record history without mechanisms to record it. Printing presses and technologies. Even if we have a printing press, you're going to have to print on something that lasts forever. Otherwise, it's lost. Or, whatever you printed on that was temporary must be transferred over and over and over again to keep it. And then, if language updates and changes, the meanings of words change. And so, someone's going to have to store the transformation of the language and the, and the transformation of the interpretation. So, that's just straight-up attrition. It has nothing to do with a conspiracy. It's just man, right? And then you have the folks that, that understood at some point that if they can convince you they are in charge, if they can convince you that their blood is royal, better than yours, that by divine right, as also beautifully illustrated in Monty Python's A Quest for the Holy Grail, they get to rule you because they're better than you. And you just sometimes, you know, when we're younger, we just, oh yeah, definitely, sure, uh uh-huh. And the other thing, too, is that if you prioritize certain knowledge base over your own knowledge base, you can subjugate yourself to other people very quickly. Uh, Being a technical person pretty much my entire life, due to my professions, I will meet people, and uh, this doesn't happen as often, and I'm glad, but there's been points in my life where I'll meet someone, and they'll have a normal job. That's great. It has a job with a much better lifespan than the jobs that I have. And they got to perfect it at a young age and keep that job their whole life. It's never going to change, right? Accounting never changes, right? But I've seen them hang their head in conversations if I said, oh, I do this, this, and this, and it's slightly more, I don't know, entertaining looking, or they had uh, maybe a suspicion that they might have wanted to get into that career. And it's sad because there's nothing less about them than me. In fact... I've said a hundred times to these folks, you picked a much better profession than I did because you get your life. You go to work, you do a great job. You can come home knowing you did a great job. And then you got the rest of your life at night to do whatever you want. Your weekends are yours. These people have gone on tons of vacations. I've never gone on. They've seen more of the world than I'll ever see because they had the normal job. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. In fact, I think they're the winners. Okay. You want to become a a computer engineer, you're nuts. You're talking about being unemployed by 50, unless you are super aggressive about your career. And man, you know, it's hard to be excited about learning it all over again, right? And, you know, right now we're seeing coding going backwards, basically. So history has been manipulated to keep people in power. We know this. But it's manipulated at every conceivable metric that the mind can digest history so that you feel inferior to a ruling class. So I'm very glad that there's a Tartarian movement. I don't know, again, I don't think I've ever seen any convincing evidence that there was a Tartarian race. And there are tons of videos showing you old maps and saying this is where they lived and there was a place called Tartarian on a map. Again, there are great artists out there that can draw these maps. Uh, Potentially, if someone's going to say they've got a map, and do a video, they need to show where they found it, what museum it was in, what, you know, archive it was pulled out of, and even that could be manipulated, right? For instance, when they did the conspiracy that the Titanic was the ship that sank, they knew that the, was it J.P. Morgan and his gang, knew that they sunk the Olympic, because it was actually, decom- it was actually announced publicly, that ship is total, it has had three major accidents in six months, And so they knew, well, uh, we don't want to uh, pay the insurance fee on this whole thing and rebuild the hull. So they relabeled the Titanic, the Olympic, and the Olympic, the Titanic, and sunk the Olympic. And then the Titanic, which was supposed to be the, which was now renamed the Olympic, the Olympic was totaled, and it went from 1912 all the way up to past World War II. Incapable of actually doing that, as, as documented in the local newspapers. So what they did, the reason why I mention this, is they knew the conspiracy back in the day, and they took the blueprints and they swapped. The, the only physical difference was the, uh, the front of the um, command area. One was slightly bowed and one was flat. Well, they swapped the 
blueprints and stored them so that a hundred years later, when a guy from England had done all of his research and proved, go see my episode on that if you, uh, I'll show you the photographic proof that it was swapped, okay? Proof, okay? I save it to the end. They showed him the blueprints and said, see, you're wrong. The one on the bottom matches this one. And the, the Olympics look at the pictures of it in 1947 and whatever. And they decommissioned. I think it was even decommissioned in the early 50s, if I remember right. And he hung his head and he was, he, oh, I guess I was wrong. I, I hope he didn't really believe it because he was right. So they can store revised history at all these different levels. So they know that someone's going to challenge him at some point. And now they know how to do it big time, right? A good companion episode to this one is on this channel, and it's called History is the Matrix, and it will demonstrate to you, because of digital media, the revisionistic history happens in real time. They find out how much we find out, and they shift it, and they disinfo it, and they gaslight it to the point you can't find the truth anymore. So go see that episode. DeepThoughtsRadio.com if you have a problem finding it. So there's another one that's being attached to Tartarianism. It has nothing to do with the Tartarian movement at all, other than they're claiming it's in the envelope of false history. I'm going to go after two different areas, okay? One of them is this idea that these giant structures like Devil's Tower is an old tree, and there's several of them around the world. The other one is, is that there are lots of rocks mountains that if photographed from a particular angle, okay, can look like a human, can look like an alligator, a dragon, a serpent, a guy's head, a girl's chest, even the private parts on both sides of the fence. And these people are trying to get citizens to believe that these are silicon-based conversions, rock-based conversions of those original beings in that they're lying down. So I'm going to go for that one first, because it's the most asinine of them all. If you are an artist for 50 years, like myself, you have gone to school to learn how to draw everything I just mentioned. The human form will take you the, your entire life to learn how to draw. You can always get better. But animals are also an extreme discipline. You must choose to be a serpent, you know, snake drawer to really get into it to combine it into uh, fantasy stuff, to be a dragon, right? You have to study bat wings and how all the, the all of the tension goes off of the skin, the epidermis, and how it works. If you want to paint it color, you got to figure out the vascular system, how much blood goes through this part versus that part. Alligators and, and crustaceans, you know, fish and lions. When you have drawn hundreds of these things and you see these videos online saying that's a dude's face that's this that's this anatomically i have not seen one other than like uh what mount rushmore and the other uh native american one they're building right now they're built they're sculpted to look perfect okay I mean, what's going to happen in 200 years if the lunacy doesn't end? They're going to point at Mount Rushmore and say, look, there used to be presidents in a mountain. I mean, that's the, that's the lunacy of it all. But the thing that is uh, happening is that these folks are clickbaiting the crap out of society. Okay. And it might be that people that believe this are absolutely unsalvageable. But let's just say you've got a man's face. Uh, one of them was a man's face in a forest. Uh, it looked like somewhere in Ireland, but it could be in South America as well. That would mean if that's a fossilized head and there's a fossilized alligator, that you could simply dig into that area and you're gonna, you have to find the rest of the body. Shoulder blades and, and uh, uh, chest plates and and. If you were to cut it in half or knock it in half, you should see all the vascular system cut in half, all the veins and the arteries cut in half, right? 100% was a live thing. Just dig, and you're going to find it. Of course, people are just taking photographs online, suggesting it out of their basements in Kansas, and they don't have any other evidence, but they're pushing this out there like crazy, essentially gaslighting an entire group of people into believing that that's potentially true. 
so that if they find anything that is true and that really matters in the world, to make the world a better place, to stop evil from doing what it does, and they go, did you know they used to have living robots in the 1800s that worked in assembly lines? And that everything that looks real in the world used to be real, but it's just, uh, it, it, it died and it, it got stuck in a mountain, right? There's no just dude lying out uh, in a field perfectly. None of that. It's always a partial uh, exposure of something. Some of them are pretty good. But the other one is, uh, there's a lot of fakes out there too. It's always important to go, well, where is that? Show me. It also could be an indigenous group of people that simply said, look, we worship alligators because they're so mean, they're so amazing that we actually celebrate its ability to kill. And we found some, we found a little layer of stones that kind of look like one. So we worked on it over the course of like 500 years and honed it out. And we know exactly what these alligators look like. So it looks like an alligator now. It's a sculpture, just like Mount Rushmore. It wasn't real. Okay. And I hope that most of the people that subscribe to this channel are like, yeah, duh. But just know it's out there and it's being pumped like crazy on channels that actually have very good information as well. And again, I like the exercise. Consider all things. Look at all things. There's no crime in that. There's no crime in saying, man, do you think that could be real? That's absolutely cool. I think that you just got to go, well, let's uh, fly there and dig it out. You know, it's like, oh, 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 yeah, it's nothing. Now, trees. This isn't really terribly important, except that it will help you understand how the world really works. Why is expanding Earth very important to mankind? Because we don't know when it expands and how it expands. As of, uh, I think, 96, the recorded expansion was 19 centimeters a year recorded by all world agencies. And then they reworked the formula to erase it because they realized that if you understand that the world expands, you'll rediscover ether and you'll rediscover methane turning into crude oil and you realize there's no scarcity of oil. And you're going to find out that the oceans are going to continue to get bigger. But that the main continents will split and split and split and split. They're going to knock into different sections. Pangea Drift, it was a recent re-engineering of how we believe the world to work to preserve the fraud that is fossil fuel. Now, let's say you've got an Earth about one-fourth the size. That's about the size of Earth. Once you shrink up all the oceans, the new land is the ocean, okay? All the continents connect on all sides. Top to bottom, okay? Which is why you can't have the disk thing from... Flat Earth, it doesn't make any sense because the bottoms all attach perfectly. If you're not studying expanding Earth and you're hanging on to Flat Earth, then you're in a, a level of denial you need to get out of. You have to understand this, okay? We could still be in a matrix, so then there's no rules at all about where we are. Cosmology is just a simulation. It's the uh, consensus reality. We all believe it, therefore it is, right? So you could have literally some people live in a dimension where it's flat and other people live in a dimension where it's round. Some people could live in maybe a Pangea Drift dimension and I'd live in the Expanding Earth dimension. But go look at my episode on Expanding Earth event. Because that was a cataclysmic event of major flooding around the world. For those of you who believe in mud flooding, I want you to look at that episode, Expanding Earth event. If you need an explanation as to how Metric billions of tons of soil got moved around the world very quickly and man got largely erased off the surface of the earth because of flooding and drowning. Those who lived in the mountains were safe. Those who lived in areas unaffected by the giant tsunamis that came through where the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean potentially one mile lower than the Indian Ocean. And when the Indian Ocean splashed into Pacific Ocean at a mile higher. You can see it on the bottom of, of Google Earth, right around the Indonesian Japanese islands. You can see the sludge mark on the bottom of the ocean where it happened. It's a sludge mark, okay? When it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck, okay? This happened. 
That's why Kansas, where I grew up, has seashells all over the plains, but there was never any ocean there. Not even with Pangaea Drift, especially with Pangaea Drift, there'd be no ocean in Kansas. But as this gigantic wave hit California and then splashed all the way into the mid plains, that's where you get it. Now, if you have an Earth that's got lots of volcanic activity, okay, because it's, a, you know, it's, it's making its thing, it's cooling off for the very first time so that life itself can be embedded on the surface, be it God or the universe through evolution, it's going to go through that phase. You're going to have tons of volcanoes. Now, there's two types of volcanoes, structurally speaking. You can have a Mount Fiji, right, so it goes up, and it's got a little reservoir of magma at the top, right? Lava. It can level off up there. But you can also have pits where all the land is on the same level and you just have a pit of lava. Okay? Now that's obviously coming from the bowels of the earth, which is a big giant plasma ball of super fast ethereal energy. It slows down and becomes lightning. Okay? And that's why lightning hits the ground. It's going back to ground. It's going back to its it's it's a source of polarity right when volcanoes uh, erupt you'll see lightning bolts come out of, of volcanoes it's because it's coming out of the bowels of the earth okay it's a plasma core not a nickel iron core remember nickel iron loses all of its magnetism at 6500 degrees fahrenheit which is nothing but they'll tell you it's like millions of degrees at the center of the uh, earth but with a electromagnetic plasma core spinning in a torus, which makes an hourglass in the middle, you will have North Pole and South Pole working on a compass. Animals will know North and South because it's constantly swimming if you have the right sensory input in your brain. Well, what do you think happens when the Earth expands from one-fourth the size to the size it is today? Well, that which is malleable, soil, will redistribute. That which is hard iron... <laughs> Magma, okay, will temper into hexagonal strips, hence Devil's Tower, hence all of these hexagonal formations, which if you pay attention, they're always going in a nice flow, which people are misconstruing as the base of a tree. All you've had is someone basically take a hose to an old volcano and just simply hose it down at the size of God, right? And you're just cleaning off all of the dirt off of this dried volcano. And you'll have a devil's tower thing right in the center, tempered perfectly if it's completely dried out. Okay. They're not trees, people. They're not trees. But why do they resemble trees? You might say that. Well, God, it looks just like a tree. You're stupid, man. You just said quack like a duck, you know, walks like a duck. All right. There's a book of physics, okay? One of, the mis, one of the most misconstrued statements that is one of the most important statements that human beings in this cosmology, a soul-body-mind connection, right, can understand that we are blowing it big time, is the biblical statement, as it is above, so too it is below. It's been misconstrued as water above, water below. Talk about missing the mark completely, okay? You're not doing God any favors with that theory. What would be a cosmology of the sea? How dark do you think it would be up above during the day if the, if the sea was like infinitely thick above you? Have you ever looked into the ocean? It's only light for about 10 feet, and then it's like black down there, and it's not good, right? That is not what the statement means. The statement is telling you that the physics that creates the entire universe is infinitely in the macro as it is in the micro. So what can exist in the micro, down below, can exist in the macro and vice versa. It's the same book of physics. Why is the Fibonacci pattern absolutely everywhere in the universe? At least, let's just, let's just say that's Earth, okay? Cactus. They grow perfectly, the Fibonacci pattern. A rose grows the Fibonacci pattern, not only in its thorn distribution up the stem, but the petals that pop out of the top. The reason why a flower is so gorgeous is that you're seeing a foundry of biological matter responding to the ejection of ethereal currents. Why do you think grass grows up? 
if gravity is molecules pulling against molecules, which is not what gravity is, okay, why would grass ever grow up? How could a crystal even remotely go up as a life force? When you plant a seed and it gets watered, why would it ever go up? It should go down. That's where all the force is, right? It's because that's not what it is. The earth is ejecting its ether all the time because there's a lot of pressure as it's going in. That's how come it expands, okay? And it's going out like hairs. Why do you think humans have hairs on their head? It's the ether ejecting out of our epidermis. It is, okay? Now, why I have more hair on my back now when I was 15, I don't understand that, but must have to do with getting kicked out of the tribe later on in life because you become an old crabby bastard. So they give you more hair on your back so you can uh, survive the winter or something. Get out of here, old man. Expanding Earth is important because we're getting earthquakes in places that we didn't traditionally know them to exist in recorded history. One of the biggest earthquakes in the United States uh, happened in the Midwest, right along the Mississippi River. They're still debating on how big it might have been, but it made the Mississippi River go in the opposite direction, at least for large segments of it. Can you imagine that? If you've ever seen the Mississippi River, it's hard to imagine it suddenly going the other direction, okay? Now, they blame earthquakes on things like fracking and other stuff, and that may very well be contributing to some of the more minor ones. But my entire life, uh, as a child, they said that California was going to fall off into the Pacific Ocean. Well, how is that possible? Because it's going to expand, and it will eventually break off at the San Andreas Fault, and it's basically going to create a seam there. It's going to be a long time from now, but whatever happened at the Grand Canyon is exactly what's going to happen there. It might fill up with water. It might become a Grand Canyon. Who knows? Maybe it's a Grand Canyon first, and then it becomes uh, a separation of the peninsula. It was the, literally the key point of the first Superman movie with Lex Luthor being played by Gene Hackman and Christopher Reeve. He was going to put a nuke right there, cause a major earthquake, and cause it to fall. And he actually took his cane and slammed it against a uh, glass overlay on the wall. And, and the glass, you know, ejected off of the uh, North American continent. This was always what they said when I was a kid. They don't say it anymore because Pandria Drift takes over which is all subduction and everything's moving underneath everything. There's no force to, to account for subduction. The race is on to find out as much as we can find out in the time that's left where society is a free society because society has become a goldfish brain, nonlinear mind. The reason why I'm making this episode kind of relates to taking a risk when we were young. Remember when you were a kid and uh, you're, you need to practice something and you don't have a good adult there or mentor to get you back on your feet if you happen to slip. Let's say it's something physical. Maybe you want to walk a tightrope. I don't know. Anything. And you try this new thing and you fail. And maybe you try a couple more times if you're tenacious as a human being. But you continually fail. And it's going to take more tries. Or you actually need a completely different technique. If you can get past that failure rate and understand that those who are successful at something have failed more than everybody else at that thing, that's how they got good in the first place. Then you understand what I'm saying. If you are studying and trying to uncover history or any other area of research, okay, you're going to need to keep yourself with some sort of discipline for uh, truth, false, maybe. Those are the three judgments you will have on any piece of information. We tend to, as human beings, want to put everything in the truth pile or the lie pile, right? When we should probably lay down some scientific method, even for ourselves, right? Right? And simply say, I don't have enough information, really, to determine whether or not that is true or false. So I'm going to put it in my maybe pile. I'm going to remember it. And you could even bring it up every day and study and go, man, why can I not figure out whether or not this is true or false? It's just that or the other one. It is. Under most cases, right? If you want to succeed, you've got to have a method here. 
what I've been trying to do with these episodes is quickly assess what is wrong about a piece of information in that we cannot put it in the truth pile just yet. You might have the other piece of information that, that makes something go from a speculative possibility to a certainty. But the elements that make you believe it's a certainty will also be something that you need to analyze and make sure, well, you think that that thing and this other thing is good enough to put this in the pile. Oops, I almost made that symbol. What I have found is that I've got an episode out there that I want to mention again because it's very important and it's very, it is pure enlightenment, okay? Now, I've been an a left brain person and I've been a right brain person my whole life because I've been an engineer of software and other electronic stuff and an artist of all different kinds, right? Music, art. I am the walking effigy of Godel Escher Bach. Okay. I am. A lot of you are. When you massage up your left and right brain continuously every day of your life and the younger you are hearing my message right now, the better. Okay. You will stumble onto something that will shock you eventually, hopefully. It's probably different for all of us, so I can't quite give it to you uh, other, any other way than what happened to me. I think this is attainable by everyone hearing my voice. You gain what is called the absolute mind. I have a whole episode on it, okay? Extremely valuable if you get what I'm saying in the next few sentences, okay? I have an episode that will explain what the absolute mind can give you, and it's called The Infinity Blind Spot. It's another episode. That episode is about man having this general barrier of conception when we really try to contemplate any aspect of infinity, the infinite universe, an infinite number system. Count to infinity, go, I'll wait, right? Well, you could be going down in decimal places, positive, negative, it, it immediately troubles our circuitry, infinity. So we tend to reject any paradigm that lives in an infinite container, an infinite paradigm of existence. God, when I say God has no beginning, has no end, because he never did. He never had a beginning. He is the is. He is the imaginary infinity symbol of a italic I with the plural S. He is an is, okay? He being just relative to nomenclature that we use today. What the absolute mind gives you is this unbelievable ability to conceive of infinity, to see things in an infinite universe. So is it, a, you know, so too is it, uh, as it is above, so too is it below. That's actually a statement of pure infinity. It is the fractal that goes up and the fractal that goes down. And if you studied fractals in the what late 80s, okay, you know it's a really simple little formula. The Mandelbrot's a very simple formula. And what it does is it does a little, little tiny calculation, but it takes the result of that calculation and puts it back in the algorithm. That's infinity. When you reach your absolute mind, something really bizarre happens. You find yourself, if, if you get the experience like I had it, excuse me, you'll find yourself a child with a new brain. None of us remember, uh, that I know of, truly being a baby out of your mother's womb and going, oh my God, what is this place? I mean, maybe we were still the old man or old woman we were when we uh, left the last time we were here. But imagine showing up in a universe and you've got a blank slate. But in that slate, it has no barriers. You're staring into the abyss of infinity. And whatever you want to contemplate, you simply introduce the infinite set of it into the center, and no longer do you have a blind spot. All of a sudden, infinite theories become accessible to you. Are you conceiving of infinity, truly? No. But you can understand the physics of infinity. I think one has to actively merge what you have built on the left with the right. What happened to me was I started this show. And so I was introducing tons of topics in the first season about helping you manage your life so you can get as much success as I've had, plus a shitload more. It's important to me. I am not in competition with anyone on this planet, nor have I ever been in competition with anybody on this planet. 
if everybody succeeded more than me, but I'm still happy, boom, infinite thumbs up, okay? But by creating episodes for you folks and letting my mind swim to the left and swim to the right and then swim to left, right, left, right within a particular episode, I drew like a Pied Piper, my left brain and my right brain to work together so that I could give you episodes, okay? That was just how it happened for me. And I was sitting in my backyard in my old house, right? And I remember one night, just it just hit me, and it was actually like a, a daydream. I could feel my right, and I could feel my left. And what that meant for me was a linear history of all things that happened to, hap- happened to me in my life that made up both sides of those hemispheres, almost mutually exclusive from each other in some cases. But in the middle was a void, but it wasn't scary. And all of a sudden, and it was really when I was pushing into ethereal research, getting into Eric Dollard, who was getting me into everybody from, you know, Tesla back to Faraday and then beyond. Uh, You'll find out that the universe has been very ethereal in its research for a very long time. That's what the pyramids are. The pyramids are giant power stations. All of the Tartarian structures that they keep studying, one of the most amazing things to look into is the fact that all these buildings from the Gilded Era had these spikes on the top, little balls on them. You'll still see them to this day, right? Sometimes they're more decorative today because they're not allowed to function. But I think that they discovered this in the pyramids, the conductive limestone on the inside, the non-conductive layer on the outside, which has all been removed so they don't work anymore. Even the archaeologists will tell you they get major static discharges if they climb all over the pyramids, especially at the very top of the Paramerdian stones have been removed. But these Tartarian buildings, these Gilded Era buildings, look like they had generated, they had made a structure that generated their own power, enough for all the lights. You know, they're not running giant uh, Bitcoin GPS labs in the basement. They just want a little bit of light, maybe a little bit of heat, Maybe they didn't use it for heat. Maybe they just use it for light. Whatever it was, healing in general is what we suspect in cathedrals and what have you. But if you look at all the geometry of cathedrals down to Gilded Era buildings, they all kept the domes. They sing into the domes so that the dome will heal the people. The blimp, or the dirigible as they used to call them. Blimps seemed to fly all over the world at one point, starting in the late 1800s. Some people think they went back even further. Apparently, a guy was flying a a blimp in San Francisco in the late 1800s. It was this big conspiracy. This guy was in there. But the blimps keep docking at all of those little pikes on all these other buildings, even on pikes that are on ships in the ocean. They They would tip themselves vertically. So the tip of the of the blimp would touch the ship. Well, the ship has no fuel on it. Little tiny tugboats. They don't need to be tugged into shore. They can fly into shore. They landed on a dime all the time. The Hindenburg, we think, might have been a conspiracy to kill that mode of transportation because it was wonderful. I told you several times that my grandmother said that she had seen uh, what looked like cigar-shaped vehicles flying over uh, southeastern Kansas. Well, maybe they're not UFOs. Maybe they were just blimps. Never know, right? Right. But the absolute mind will get you plugged into ether, ether of the body, ether of the universe. Again, it's all the same algorithms, which is why there was a, uh, well, people are seeing the same uh, formation physics in a lot of different things. So the same formation of uh, magma escaping the pressures of the surface of the earth and drying out and turning into Devil's Tower resembles a stump of a tree. Well, why wouldn't the same physics, okay, remember I told you it's pushing out, okay? Again, gravity pushing down wouldn't allow this to happen, right? But you have blades of grass coming out. Well, they're never going to turn it to a tree because they've already completed their crystal and structure. Very thin little blades. When you have trees, ah, well, they're amassing crystal proteins and, and chromosomes at a different rate. Their cellular structure is different. But the way that they fight the universe, the way that they interact with gravity in general, is the exact same massaging force that massaged all that magma into place where it tempered into those hexagonal stones. Craters hitting Earth, or you know, craters being created by uh, objects from Earth, 
or sorry, from outer space, excuse me, are largely just old volcanoes that have dried up and they, they create a dish and the older they are, there's no magma, there is no nothing. And yes, there's iron little rocks everywhere, which they try to tell you are from an exploding asteroid, like the one in Arizona, which I've been to six times, my whole childhood, from probably seven years old all the way up to my 20s. I've been there several times. Last time there's a huge infestation of bugs. That is an old volcano. That is not a meteor from space. Go look at Diamond Head and all of the formations of volcanoes in Hawaii and try to tell me they're not exactly identical. Same physics. As it is above, so too is it below. It doesn't mean that, uh, that one thing is related to another all the time. But those two are exactly the same thing. All the craters on the moon's surface cannot all be circular if they're coming in from random trajectories from space. Yet all of them are. The moon used to be boiling at some point. It used to be on fire. Hence, it's covered in ash. Okay? Just let it be. Let, let science be. This ashtray I got right here looks more like the moon than any other place in the universe. Maybe other moons don't work that way, but ours did. But a recent one I saw today was absolutely hysterical. Someone found some quartz that had been basically naturally eroded, I think. You know, quartz can have all kinds of different colors. I don't know if someone took this into Photoshop. But they found quartz that was the color of meat. Slightly. And then they uh, they went to a butcher uh, facility and showed meat stacked up. You know, been all slaughtered and stacked up clean. And then they showed this quartz and they showed the meat and they showed the quartz. And they said, see, we all used to be uh, meat. And then we, these giants, they, they basically died and became quartz. Again, the quartz is not arranged in any biological sensibility. It's just rock in the side of a mountain. Okay. The physics, why are all of the branches of a tree look like the vascular system in a human lung? A fractal. It is the infinite world. So one of the reasons why I wanted to mention the absolute mind is that you might already have it, or you might have it open. You might have the door open and you're not looking at it. And all you got to do is go in. If you have the experience I had, you can have a deep scientific background, a deep creative background. For me, the beauty of it was when I went into it, and I remember sitting on my back patio by myself at night, probably smoking a stick. And I just had a moment where I was looking into it and I was an infant and I was not scared. It was, this is a supercomputer that combines both strategies of left and right brain, the creative side, you know, who knows if that really exists inside the head, but we know we've got logic circuit and a creative circuit. What do you want to do with this computer? It's like ChatGPT without any censorship on it, knows everything, what question you want to ask, because you're going to get the right answer. The catch is, is just like ChatGPT, shit in, shit out. Ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer back. Don't blame ChatGPT. It's you. It's You're not asking a very good question. Yeah, there's areas it doesn't know, but man, it's hard to find it. You have to be very theoretical, or you have to be against, you know, quote-unquote science, and then it'll tell you a bunch of boilerplate crap that's not true. But I find that if you get it off on side conversations and not mention the key words that it's trying to defend against, it'll actually tell you the truth. It's interesting. ChatGPT believes in ether. You just can't use the word, but you can use everything else. When the CERN Hadron Collider completes a collision, they've got a bunch of dust... uh, electrical patterns in all those dishes, right? So the collision happens and and this electrical cloud comes off the collision of the two protons slamming into each other, right? Well, they cancel out what they call noise with the sigma-5 algorithm. And whatever's left is what they acknowledge as a quark or some other fundamental construct of atomic energy, okay? They're subtracting the ether. What do you think the other stuff is, guys, right? Oh, it's just thermalizing energy. Okay, so that has a name. You do realize that, right? Just because your algorithm and your current understanding of science and your current level of quark counting 
and your ability to build a sensor that's that's meticulous enough and dense enough to see the spins of those currents is not doesn't exist. You just cancel out what you can't find. I told you guys a long time ago, scientists basically say that if they can't build a sensor to sense something existing, then it's Napoleonic law. It doesn't exist until we say it exists. But what's the most amazing machine in the universe that we know of as Homo sapiens? It's us. We don't have five senses. We have infinite senses. And that's not just some hippie crystal rubbing thing. It's real. You sense people's emotional states. You sense auras, whether you can see them or not. I've never seen anybody's aura, but by God, I know when someone walks in and they're someone in their life has died or they won a lottery and a lottery ticket, you can sense that energy. Prisoners in uh, heavy-duty lockup, they'll tell you when it's about to go down in the cafeteria or the um, general population out there, they can feel it. And everyone hides who doesn't want to get into the fight. They just basically walk out of the cafeteria. If they're not being called on to do something, they know it's about to go down and nothing good's going to happen. A buddy of mine, very secular dude. Um, this is like 30 years ago. Very secular guy. His, his name was Brian. I don't remember his last name. He was living at this house in, uh, I think it was Newbury Park or Thousand Oaks. And he was just renting a room. And he'd had a girlfriend for seven years. They were engaged. They were supposed to get married. They met in high school, you know, or grade school or not grade school, middle school, whatever. But now he's about 24. <clears throat> he wants to seal the deal, right? Well, they, uh, he, in this house, he had a woman at the end of the hallway who used to do readings for people and tarot cards and all this other stuff. But she said she would, she's a hairdresser and she would cut his hair and they kind of talked. So that's how he knew her. It was cool. It was convenient. It was damn near free, right? But he goes out to dinner with his fiance of seven years. He and I were best friends at the time, so he told me everything. They got into some ridiculous argument. He has to pull over the car. She hops out of the car. He drives home, and like it was done. Seven years down the drain, for whatever reason. He is understandably devastated. He didn't want that to happen. It wasn't his choice to end anything. He wasn't bringing the conclusive problem to the, to the table, as they might say. So he goes home, and he is just... He's at that heartbreak level that you only get once in your life. You can never heartbreak worse than your first, your first love breaking up with you. I can speak from experience. He's also a private guy. So he walks into the house. And the way he said, I've seen his house once. It was just a big, like, three-story house. With all these people live in it. Really nice, man. But old and big. Like, just wood, you know. But they have this really long hallway. Probably 20 feet, 30 feet long. Actually, probably about 30 feet, 40 feet long. Anyway, she's at the end door. Like, her door is the last thing at the end of the hallway. And he said that he was standing at the other end of the hallway. She opens the door. He doesn't see her. He's faced into a room. And he hears her basically scream and gasp at the end of the hallway. So much so that he was like, oh, my God, like, what's going on? Like, you know, someone dying? Is there a monster in the room? He looks down at her and... He says, what's, what's wrong? And she just says, Brian, what happened? And he freaked out because he, he was already very heightened in his senses. And he says, what are you talking about? And she goes, your aura is horrible. What is, and he didn't appear. He's talking to somebody in the house, completely concealing. He just went through one of the worst experiences ever. He's not that close to everybody to be sharing it with anybody, as he told me. Boom. He all of a sudden had his mind expanded. Doesn't know exactly how to interpret it, what's real, what's not real, but that woman became a lot more legit to him. Doesn't mean the astrology and stuff is, is working the way they say, but she definitely had a gift, okay? What if I told you that if you really want to know the history of the world, you're going to have to give yourself as much input as you possibly can, but the place where I think you're going to find the truth is calming your soul. Maybe it's the absolute mind. Maybe it's some other place. But you need to listen to the logic inside yourself. 
What happened to me, and this might sound a little kooky, but when it came to researching the 20th century, and especially the teens into the 20s, into the 30s and 40s, and the banker switchover, right, where we greenlit the, uh, the, the falsely ratified 16th Amendment, which gave us the Federal Reserve and fiat currency, and the seizure of gold in the 30s during the orchestrated depression, all that kind of stuff, I could not get a... It was a Bill Schill. He did his Money Changers four and a half hour video. And I saw that, which was pretty damn good. It was the, it was like kind of like the history of currencies uh, in world history. It's amazing information. In that well, He got screwed in that video, by the way. He doesn't make any money from it if you buy it, but it's good. You can probably find it online for free. But the causality models weren't being explained to me properly. But what I did was I studied enough of the highlights of that history and then quieted my soul and over the course of like three or four months, it just came to me. My brain solved the problems of, well, if this, then that, and that, if this, and da-da-da. Then I was able to go out and use official sources, including a family member of mine that worked for the Reserve for 20 years plus, who believes all the stuff that they espouse, right? Got a lot of questions answered from her, a lot of other folks in the world, and I was able to confirm that I was given the information first and found it out second to be true. Of course, I didn't mark it as true. It was a hunch uh, due to just logic of the brain or whatever, the soul, the universe sensing things. So if you're studying history, uh, I think a lot of you have figured out that if you go back just a couple hundred years, the idea that anything's accurate beyond that point, it's, it's a guess, you know. You finding out what happened in the 1600s in any one place on this planet? Maybe. You know? History books will tell you that Native Americans are like 800 years old. <laughs> it's like they didn't exist before 800 years ago. I mean, hilarious assertions of ridiculousness. Just the sheer construction on North American and South American continent alone account for more years than that. So there's a lot of gravity for... Those who are in power are the super race, and they're the ones that invented everything, right? Stonehenge is a complete joke, right? A bunch of fallen down rocks in one location, moved to another location, very close, and had a restoration for two years in 1954. Then all of a sudden, a bunch of druids show up, and they own the place. They, they always knew what this was, and of course, they reconstructed so the solstices are perfect, and then they tell you that that's the way it was built. Hilarious. Hilarious revisionistic history. And why was Stonehenge reconstructed? So white people could say they built something before the pyramids. That's what it was. Okay. When they have no clue, truly, when all the hieroglyphs were created, they have no clue when the pyramids were built. The pyramids aren't mentioned in the hieroglyphs. So it seems like those were built second for some reason. Okay. They didn't look like tombs because they were a functional power supply. I mean, just go study hieroglyphs. Go show me where pyramids are mentioned. The symbol for a pyramid is actually the iconic symbol for gift. It's not a pyramid. You have a lot of uh, European archaeologists draw uh, pictures in hieroglyphic kind of style where they're dragging a stone and throwing water in front of it, those aren't real pictures that they found that they had made. This was modern interpretations drawn to look like that and put on history channels to make you feel like they had found the complete manual of how to create a pyramid, something that requires an absolute understanding of pi, which, again, the Greeks name it, the, the pre-dynastic Egyptians who built all that stuff and figured it out. Machu Picchu, right? I'm just going to keep throwing stuff at you for a few seconds here before I sign off. The one thing, Brian Forrester has been there over 65 times. He's probably in the hundreds by now, but he said that he brought a geologist there a couple times. And the geologist finally looked around and said, you know, one thing that's never been accounted for is that if we look at the vector of the mountain that Machu Picchu has been built on, the stones absolutely dictate that they didn't stop and create a plateau there. None of the mountains in that area have plateaus. So somebody took the top of that mountain and knocked it off and knocked it down into the valley. But there's no evidence, at least that he was able to discover, 
of the sedimentary rock that would have been the top of the mountain down in the valley. So where did it go? They say a lot of the stones that the place is built out of are from thousands of miles away. What, you mean to tell me someone's dragging stones up and down those mountains just so they could build a little hut up there? When they ask the Incas, who built this place? They say, well, the people before us, the pre-Incas. <laughs> There's plenty of reason to be studying the history of human beings. To get obsessed in the Tartarian thing without any real like genesis of the Tartarian locations and people, hmm, it doesn't really matter as long as you continue to research, in my opinion, history in general. Just keep looking, keep looking. But definitely, if you haven't subscribed to Brian Forster's channel, he's got a bunch of Egyptology, a bunch of South American stuff. He's a little rough around the edges sometimes, but he also does these incredible presentations, which he glues together for you. He sits in front of a projector at times and does presentations. They're breathtaking. And he has a very simple discipline, among others, that he looks at a structure and he goes down to the base stones first. He wants to find what were the foundational stones that laid into this thing, like Baalbek, for instance, in Lebanon. You'll see little tiny human beings on these giant 1,000 ton rocks. He gets into it. He pays the money and he gets into the, the, the places that you and I would probably find it difficult to get into. And he's been to places that have since been locked out. And he's got beautiful videos of, I mean, very detailed videos. And there's other channels that do great jobs at this too. But Brian will often talk about these things without labeling them with current history. Therefore, you get the information without getting a bias on top of it. It's interesting. So I hope you thought this was interesting. I hope you found it interesting. This is all about how to gear your mind and configure your mind to go on these journeys. You wouldn't want to go to Egypt without studying Egypt, right? You want to get all the to-dos together. You're going to find new things once you get there that you never even imagined, and you're going to spend hours and days researching things, but you don't want to go with a completely blank slate if you may never go back again. Some of these dudes, I don't know how they even pay for it, man. They go all over the world constantly. They must be on planes constantly in Jeeps, and they have to drive hours to get to certain locations just to look at a little box. Sometimes they have to go down and underneath uh, old pyramids that you wouldn't even know they're pyramids, but down underneath are chambers and mitered boxes that will blow your mind. You know, they, they are the most precise man-made objects in the world because they're cut out of one stone, you know? So as you do your online version of it, just realize that there's a lot of groups out there from every walk of life, from government walks of life to just schmoes trying to get a click out of you because they're so worried about their subscription count, right? The important thing is, is that you, you I think too, you want to grab any piece of information, like a video or a piece or a photograph that you were compelled to, you know, it compelled you. It was like, whoa, that's wild. Save it to your hard drive, whatever you got to do so that you can go back and examine it later in life. Because if you just let it come in and come out, you're going to make a fish brain, right? You need to see things over and over and over. The amount of times that I have sat and stared at photographs of the pyramids, and I found a couple videos recently that actually analyzed every single rock that made up the Great Pyramid and how they configured their construction. It never even occurred to me until a couple of years ago, and I found the series where this dude was meticulously studying the size, the height, the width, and how many little rocks are put into here and all this. And it's just the valence layer uh, that was underneath the actual valence, which was smooth. If a big organization is telling you that something is true, sadly, I have to tell you, be more skeptical. You know this is the way it works, right? The Smithsonian has been probably one of the most revisionistic organizations on planet Earth, getting rid of all the evidence of the giants that they found in North America, all the skeletons but documented in hundreds of newspapers, viewed by doctors and archaeologists and scientists, not just Joe Bob, the cowboy down the street, but finding, you know, thousands of little tiny pygmy bodies, which when measuring the pelvis, they could find out this is a female that's had a baby. The pelvis has already shifted for the baby uh, birthing cycle. 
but their little bodies are teeny tiny. They were a race of humans that were smaller. And that makes more sense, doesn't it? Especially if you want to go evolution style. Every single permeation of human beings should exist. Elves and dwarfs and giants and ogres and humans. It should all exist until we have battle royale and we get rid of it all. I don't know why they want to hide that. If anything, you think you could spin it as a victorious thing that homo sapiens, our size, were the ones that fought and won, you know, whatever. So anyway, this is what turns me on. If you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. It's pretty spruced up. <clears throat> I think um, probably 90, 95% of all the thumbnails have been redone. They've been redone strategically, by the way. In most cases, I've tried to get the artwork to match what's in the episode uh, to the best of my ability. There's probably a good 25% of the episodes that are so esoteric, the artwork resembles that. But where I can, I try to make it exact. But anyway, we have everything up there to the Patreon, PayPal folks. Thank you so much and make it happen. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.